Welcome to the Jonathan Van Bilsen Show featuring lively, in-depth conversation with compelling guests from our community. And here is our host, Jonathan Van Bilsen. Thank you and welcome. My guest today is Jeff Carpenter, a published author, an eco-tour guide, and an environmental consultant. He's been to all seven continents and has some very interesting experiences. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Good to see you. So, I need to ask you because your name is spelled Carpentier, but you go by Carpenter. So, what's the history there? Well, I started my life in, in French Canada, so it was easy. Everybody could pronounce it. But when I moved to English Canada, went to University of Guelph, nobody spoke French. And it was just too complicated to always explain how to pronounce it. So, I anglicized it. Excellent. And I won't ask about the spelling of Jeff. We'll just let that one go. We shall. <laughs> so, um, now how does one get into the world of nature? For me, it was uh, it started very early. I was about 13 years old. I used to go out with my dad. Uh, we'd, we'd go hunting and fishing. Well, he would go hunting mostly because I was too young. But uh, when you live in northern Ontario, there's not a lot to do. So you take advantage of the out of doors. Eventually, I found that I really didn't like hunting at all, even when I was old enough, and preferred to just look at the wildlife. And from there, it kind of blossomed through high school and then eventually to university where my and when you say Northern Ontario, so where, where exactly did you grow up? It was the Ottawa Valley, uh, Petawawa. I was an okay. Army brat, so we lived at CFB Petawawa, which is very re remote. Right. And you went to, you said you went to Guelph University? Yes. And studied? Zoology. Oh, which okay. Which is basically uh, the animal side of the nature kingdom. But right. I also liked the, the plant side of it as well. So as okay. time went by, I tried to learn all the disciplines associated with nature. And what was your intent when you went to university? Like, what, what did you want to... What did you want to be when you grew up, so to speak? Yeah, that was always uh, the goal uh, in the 70s when I was there, the early 70s. Everybody wanted to be a biologist, and we all wanted to work for the Ministry of Natural Resources, as it was called then. Right. Because you could be outside all the time, you could study nature, and you got paid. So that was kind of the goal. But the reality was it didn't work out. Um, there weren't any jobs when I came out, so I okay. went into a totally different field. And that field was? Pesticides. Okay. Ironically, I it's sort of the opposite a, of what uh, the opposite preserving of what the economy. You would think exactly, right. but but it was an emerging uh, industry for the government or of the for the people and the government itself, and nobody knew much about it. So right. I was able to shape the program a little bit to focus on nature and try to encourage people to use pesticides properly and to the benefit of nature where they could. Okay, so. Uh, which, of course, over the last few years has totally evolved into that exactly. People mm -hmm. are now much more conscientious about the, uh, the pesticides that they use and, and so forth to, yes. to most, most, uh, most people. Yes. Most people, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, <clears throat> so you got out of school, you, you had this great love of nature, uh, and I assume bird watching was a big part of that. Yes. Bird now, now, bird watching, sorry, bird watching. I remember as, as a photographer back in the day to see people with binoculars and not being able to capture a, a picture, uh, it was, it was uh, sort of viewed a little bit different. Were there challenges in the early days of birding? Very much so. Uh, when, I was, when I was started my birding in the 60s, um, to be a bird watcher was weird. You were, you know, you were bullied by your friends yeah. and, and people just kind of looked at you as if you were strange. So I would sneak out with my bird book in a little pack on my side and my binoculars hidden under my coat. And I would go back into the back country and, you know, hitchhike or ride my motorcycle later and just get away from people so that I could study it and not be criticized. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think as you go through the process of life, maturity tends to set in somewhere. For some of us, it's a lot later than others, but it does eventually set in. Um, that, that's very, it's very interesting. Um, as I mentioned to you that I just came back from a trip up north and I saw uh, some, some birds and a lot of people were, were staring at them and I, I found it interesting to be very honest with you. It's not something I've done before but to actually realize that they have a habitat, they have a life. It's very interesting to watch and you do get mesmerized by, by watching them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, can, I can sort of see that side of it uh, but not to have taken photographs would be very frustrating for me. But. Um, so you also do a lot of guiding, right? You've yes. been to 80 some odd countries. Um, so how did you get into guiding? Well, uh, when I was still working full time for the Ontario government, uh, I had weekends free, of course, and I would then try to take advantage of, of weekend guiding trips where I could, could do something for the Federation of Ontario Naturalists or one of the no local nature clubs. And then when I retired, I set a goal for myself that I would really like to do some international guiding okay. and become more of a professional. 
So right just before I retired, uh, I got a call from a company in Australia, and they asked me if I was interested in guiding. I said, yes, I was. And they said, have you ever been to Antarctica? And I said, well, no. They said, well, we'd like to send you there. Can you learn the wildlife? And I said, well, I already know the wildlife. And they go, why? I said, well, because I study all the time and learn about different areas. And so my first gig was uh, in Antarctica as a professional guide. Wow. I, I, I mean, I've never been to Antarctica. So wildlife comes to mind as some walruses, a few seals of some sort, and a lot of penguins. Uh, is there other wildlife there as well? Well, first of all, there's no walruses. They're in the northern <laughs> hemisphere. Sorry. Uh, lots of seals there, lots of whales there, mm -hmm. and tons and tons of birds beyond the penguins. It's a really, really exciting place. And you also have a lot of aquatic uh, invertebrates and stuff, like little uh, you know, sea spiders and sea butterflies and things like really? that that people don't appreciate. And there's jellyfish there, which would surprise you because you yeah. think they would be frozen solid. But it's a very, very versatile habitat down there. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so just before we get back into the guy, <clears throat> you said when you, you retired, uh, you, you got into that. So was that retiring from the pesticide business or? No, you... retiring. Well, when I worked in pesticides, it was for the interior government, the Ministry of the Environment. Okay. So eventually I did all of the jobs pretty much that you would do within the ministry, whether it was air pollution, you know, landfills, okay. whatever it was. So your career was with the ministry of the It was totally with okay. the ministry. And okay. then from there, then I retired from that and then moved over to this new discipline, which was right. sort of my life's passion anyways. Right. So the guiding would be interesting. Now, as I said, I've never been to Antarctica. I have guided people. I've traveled a fair bit. The trek to Antarctica, I assume you, you go down through the uh, straight uh, Drake Passage, is that right? You do. Which, which can be a little dicey at times, right? It can, yes. Um, they have a phrase, it's uh, the Drake is a wake or the Drake is a lake. <laughs> and you kind of want it somewhere in between because right. when it's too calm, it's kind of boring. You don't see much in the way of albatrosses because right. they need the wind to fly or you don't see the whales very much. When it's too stormy, then of course, uh, you, depending on your constitution, right. you might have right. some challenges. So in between is, is what you really, really like. It, I, I would be good with the lake. I, I, boredom is fine. I could live with that. The idea of, of um, you know, choppy waters and that doesn't thrill me. So the ships that you take, the, and I assume it's some type of a cruise ship, probably outfitted specifically smaller, I, I assume, than a, a massive cruise ship. Yeah, they're generally around 100 to 120 passengers okay. and maybe 75 crew, which would be people, guides like myself, but also right. the cooks and the people that clean the rooms of course. and everything else. So the ratio of, of staff to passengers is always very high. They're generally called expedition ships as opposed to cruise ships because the purpose of it is to go on an expedition to get ashore every day at okay. least once and really have an adventure that's fulsome. A cruise ship would look at Antarctica from the rail. Right. And you're, kind of, you're still there, but it's, it's a very different experience right. than being right. on the shore and walking with wildlife. Of course. So where do you actually depart from? Uh, you fly to the tip of South America, which okay. is a, a city Tierra del called, Fuego? That you're in Tierra del Fuego, but the, the, the city is actually called Ushuaia, which is the southernmost right. city in the world. It in itself is an absolutely amazing town for wildlife right? and for if you're a skier or if you love adventure, it's a great jumping off point for it. And then you board your ship and then you sail out the Beagle Channel, okay. uh, which of course was named after Darwin's Darwin, ship. Right. And then you head either directly down south towards Antarctica, or in some adventures you'll head east and go to the Falcon, the Falklands, right, uh, or Malvinas, depending if you're Argentinian or, or right, Chilean, right, right. And then from there you might go to South Georgia and then come back to Antarctica at the at the end of the journey. Okay. And how long is the trek? If you go directly from from uh, Tierra del Fuego, if you go directly to Antarctica, how long a trek would that be on a Usually boat? about 10 days. 10 days okay. is, is a good length of time. Sometimes you can get ones that will offer you four or five days, and frankly, right. you've wasted your money. You don't, right? you don't get to see enough. And, and mm -hmm. you might think that every little piece of ice looks the same or every peninsula is the same, right. but they're very different. Oh, absolutely. I'm yeah. sure. And I'm you sure. can appreciate in your own yeah. travels. How yeah, that absolutely. Is. And, and the uniqueness of, of a, a location, I think, is one of the joys of visiting it. Mm -hmm. You know, people people always ask me, did, you know, which, which country did you like best, or, mm -hmm. or have you done, you know, what did you do there, or how did, how was that sort of thing? And there is no country that I like best. I always tell people I haven't been there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that that if you look for the beauty in a place, you'll find it. And yes. the more you start finding that, the longer you can you can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. So if if so, you you get on a boat. 
and you cross the channel and you're at Antarctica. Yes. And how long would that trek be? Uh, usually, depending on the weather, about a day. You, okay. You count on a full day. But on that day, we do the training because you need to know about how to get it in and out of a Zodiac. You need to right. know about safety on the ship okay. and off the ship. You need to know about the protocols about approaching wildlife or specifically not approaching wildlife. Right. So there's a lot of training that goes on on the first day, and okay. it's, a, it's a very useful day. Plus, you get time to go outside and hopefully right. see albatrosses. That's amazing. And you now, when you guide, you don't you don't look after all 120 people on that ship, right? You have a, a group of what a dozen or so, or no, no, uh, uh, it's quite different actually. My my job as as a guide there is to go ashore with the people twice a day if we can, okay. and to mingle. So I would wander around. Oh, I'm okay. not leading a group around. I see. I'm okay, a, I'm a resource on shore. Right. What's that penguin doing? Why is that bird doing that? What's that seal doing? Okay. And then on the ship, my role is to provide the same kind of service, but often right. in a more intimate setting. Right. Or to give lectures. I was going to say, so you, you'll do presentations on yes. the ship and things like that, give people an idea of what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that would be very interesting because a lot of tours don't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you kind of, you end up in a place and, gee, what am I supposed to see now? Yeah. You know, or you get... You, you go with someone who's not that well versed in in the area that that sort of thing um and how many times have you been to uh, antarctica oh i've kind of lost count but about 35 really approximately yeah so you've seen it all then there's nothing left to see no <laughs> no <laughs> uh, it's funny because one time i was down and, and i had never been inside the antarctic circle i'd been you know and it, it's kind of a trek in itself because it right. takes an extra day there and a day back okay and it was so neat to be able to say that i've been inside of both circles now and not many people can can right. lay claim to that. And it was it was exciting. Like even though it kind of looked the same, it was yeah. just an exciting imaginary it's, line. It's, to cross. it's something that most people haven't done, and and mm -hmm. I agree with you. I, I you know I, I think most people get the same feeling. Mm -hmm. You also would have encountered possibly a remnants of say Scott's expedition or anything yeah. like that. There are well, monuments. Not, well, not yeah. We have lots of monuments. Are certainly there? Elephant Island, where his crew was was left, or Shack right. sorry Shackleton's Shackleton. crew was left when he made his way across to South right. Georgia. You know, we've, we've landed on that island, which itself is a rarity. We landed at a place called Horseshoe Bay, where, as far as we know, only 200 people had ever been there before oh, really? us. Really? Wow. It was so remote, and it was so exciting yeah. to be able to do that. Um, I mean, I don't know exactly how many people have been to Antarctica, but it's around you know, 150,000. So really? even there. It's a pretty small group. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, is, it really uh, is, con mm -hmm. considering. That's amazing. And you have a book. I have a copy of it here called Antarctica First Journey, which you wrote. Uh, it's a beautiful hardcover book. I've had the opportunity to look through it, and we'll put a picture of it up on the screen, and perhaps uh, um, uh, the information of where people can buy it if they wanted to. But this book is designed for people who, who either have been, but more so for people who are thinking about going, what will I see, what can I expect, correct? Exactly. So yes. it's like a, a guide for those wannabes for Antarctica. Exactly. So um, I may put this on my bucket list, you know. As long as you can guarantee that Drake uh, passage is, is like a lake. I guarantee anything you want as long as your <laughs> expectations are low. <laughs> uh, Jeff, we're going to take a, a short break. Some amazing stories that, that you've come out with. We will be back shortly, and we're going to see the world through the eyes of Jeff Carpenter. Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen for Photos and Travel, where we bring the world to your doorstep. Traveling during this pandemic is virtually at a standstill. However, thanks to Rogers TV and YouTube, my new show Photos and Travel is heading into its second season. Join me for a new episode every month when we get together and explore exotic locales around the world. Check local listings for dates and times or visit Jonathan Van Bilsen's Photos and Travel on YouTube. Welcome back. My guest is Jeff Carpenter, who is truly one of the last explorers of the planet. Jeff, welcome back. Thank you. So the Antarctica portion was very, very interesting, but I know you've been to, as I say, over 80 countries. So let's talk about some of the, now your very, very first gig that you did. Uh, was there anything different, special about it? Anything that comes to mind? Well, it was, uh, it was the ultimate Antarctic trip. It was the one that went to the Falklands, to South Georgia, and to Antarctica, which is the most expensive trip. But to be your first trip was amazing. And I remember, um, outwardly, I have to be this professional guide and I have to explain the wildlife. 
and I see my first penguin, and I was really like, let me tell you a bit about this penguin. <laughs> Inside, I'm going, oh my God, there's a penguin. <laughs> it was so exciting, you know, but you had to keep right. your emotions under control. And how, how large a group would that have been? It was about 110 people okay. on that particular trip. And you say it was an extensive trip, so how, how long would that have been? I think it was 19 days. Okay, so that's a long time. Yeah, it is, but yeah. it's worth it, because every one of the three destinations is different. It's like three right. different holidays packaged together. And how did you, what was your routing for flights? Uh, remember? I don't remember exactly, but but usually they go through Toronto to Buenos Aires, okay. and Buenos Aires to Ushuaia, and then you get on the ship right. and okay. return. Do the prices vary dramatically on Antarctic expeditions, or are they all around the well, same? Well, if you do the short trip, as I call it, which is directly to the continent and back, the nine right. or ten day one, it's about half the price of the nineteen day one, which okay. kind of makes sense. Yep. yep. Um, so you're, you know, it's a substantial investment, but it's something right. you will never. It's a lifetime ever experience, forget. absolutely. Unless you go thirty some odd times. Still a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. So you've also been to Venezuela. Now I understand that you had a bit of a confrontation with an anaconda. Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've traveled to South America a lot over the years, and mm -hmm. I always wanted to see an anaconda. It's funny because I had swum in, in rivers where they occurred, didn't see them. I had walked on trails made by anacondas in previous trips, didn't see them. So I, at one point, I wanted to go and see if I could catch one. Okay. Normally, I don't like to touch wildlife, but this was something that I'd researched, and you can handle them briefly, right. take your photos, and, and be gone. So we found uh, a, a place... Um, uh, down there in the Llanos, which is sort of the central part of Venezuela where the anacondas occur. And we did our, our research and found a slough where we thought they should be. Right. And it's kind of a tricky procedure because what you do basically is to, you get into the mud, the swamp, you have a stick, and you have usually your stocking feet only, and you're trying to either touch a snake underwater with a stick right. to find out it's there or touch it with your foot. Okay. And it sounds... It's kind of neat, right. actually. So we found our first snake by touching it with our foot. Then you've got to mm -hmm. figure out which end is the head. Right. So you have to reach down and slide your hand gently along its back. If you get resistance, you're going towards the head. If it's okay. smooth, you're going towards the tail because of the, the texture of on course. the snake. So right. um, we caught it and took our photographs and released it. This was just a little one. This was about 11 and some eleven feet and some odd inches. I think we have a photo of, of uh, an anaconda we can, we can put up on the screen. Um, I, I have been in places where they put a snake around your neck mm -hmm. and you have your photo taken. And I, I, it was a photograph that I had because of video which see me shaking to death. Mm -hmm. um, and it, because an anaconda, like I've seen garter, garter snakes and, and you know, they're, they're fine at mm -hmm. a distance. Um, I'm not sure about stepping on, on a snake or nudging it with my toe and then picking it up and having, it's, it's an experience. And I'm assuming that they're harmless. Well, no, no, they can hurt you. I mean, they're okay. big enough. This snake was big enough to hurt you. And they can bite. Okay. Uh, so you really do need to be confident in what you're doing. You don't just go, I'm going to catch a snake tomorrow right. and do it. So you need to be thinking a bit about the risk. And, and okay. I'm, more for me, I don't want to harm the animal. Of course. I want of it course. to be Absolutely. just the way it was when I left. And right. So with this particular snake, we put it back. And uh, the only person that got hurt was me. Because uh, we had crossed, uh, it, there's a lot of cattle around, and we had crossed this electric fence, and we right. checked to make sure that it was off on the way in. Right. Somebody turned it on on the way out, and <laughs> you had to climb over it. Right. And I'm just thankful that I had all my children out of the way by the time <laughs> I discovered the car was still on. <laughs> that can be uh, scary. It's, it's not exactly the sort of misadventure I expected to hear, no. you know, when you're anaconda searching, but it was interesting. So I, I've just returned from, from Churchill where I saw a slew of polar bears, very, very impressed, only to find out that you were in Nunavut and you ran into a polar bear by accident as you got off the, uh, I guess, the, the boat or, or whatever. Well, the first encounter I had with, uh, with polar bears was on Agamaski Island, which if you look on a map of James Bay, there's a big island sort okay. of in the middle of it. Um, it's, it's spelled Akamiski, but it's pronounced Agamaski. Okay. So, anyway, so we're flying in, and there wasn't enough seats for us, so I got to sit in the co-pilot seat, right. which was a wonderful spot. And as we're coming in, we look down on the beach, and there's this big polar bear down there, and it's sort of pawing at the sky towards us. And right. I thought, wow, this is like so incredible, and we circled a little bit to see it. And then we landed really, really close to where it was, because our right. camp was right there. And then uh, we walked back from camp once we had landed safely and tried to determine where the bear was. And it wasn't right. in sight. 
at that point, which is good and bad because yeah. you don't really know where it is anymore. Which is not good. No, no. <laughs> so um, I've had lots of adventures with yeah. them over the years, but I've never had a close call. Um, right. As a guide, we're heavily trained. We understand the, the, the cues, right. the, the, the clues that they give us that right. they're upset. Right. And we always will stay far away because right. not just for our own safety, but it's all the people that are relying right. on us. And you want to protect the environment. I of mean, course. you know, yeah. there, there's so much, the ecosystem is so balanced that you can mm -hmm. set it off very easily. I, I understand that. Um, you've also gone helicopter flying at over 100 kilometers an hour to spot rare birds. Yeah. Um, now, that, um, that's quite a speed to be you know, viewing birds. Well, I went up uh, to, to the James Bay, Hudson Bay Lowlands uh, a few years mm -hmm. ago and Part of it, we were trying to study uh, breeding birds up there, and we were on a jet helicopter going towards what used to be Winnisk, which is now Pewatin, which is up on the, right. the bottom end of, of Hudson Bay. And um, there's a distinct bird that has rarely nested in Ontario called a little gull. And uh, it's very distinct from the air because it's all gray on the back, but under right. the wings is jet black. So from a distance, you can see it. So okay. we're flying very fast. And I see one of these birds below us, and it flips up, and I can see the black wing. Right. So I said to the pilot, can you get me back there? And if you've ever flown over the north, you know that it, there's no landmarks. It's right, just right. It's just millions yeah. of puddles. And, and everything looks the same. Exactly. Yeah. And this guy did a maneuver in the air, and he brought me back within a few seconds directly over the bird. Right. Not only did we find it, but I was able to look down and see the nest from the helicopter, got some photographs of it, right. and it was the... the one of the first confirmed breedings for the species in Ontario, because it's an old world, a, a European species, typically. It's quite a ways to see it. Yeah. Um, so the one thing that I was, I, I, I'm not sure if I want to touch on it, is, is India and the tiger adventure. Um, and I, I say that tongue in cheek because I did spend a, a fair bit of time in India. I went to the north in search of tigers, and the most I saw was a footprint, because I did not realize there were only some 400 tigers in the wild in India. So I understand that your experience was a little bit different from mine. Mm -hmm. We had very good luck. I went mm -hmm. there for about five weeks uh, through various parts of northern India, and I think we ended up seeing nine or ten different tigers while we wow. were there. But um, one adventure comes to mind because my wife, Kim, was, was with me on that mm -hmm. particular one. And um, we were lucky to have uh, a local guide who was a senior guide. And, right. and that means you might get to go to places that other people right. don't go, because right. there's always better spots. And they do try to protect the tigers, obviously, right. and, and try to keep the intrusion as mi minimal as possible. Mm -hmm. So he took us to this area there, and we were standing in an open Jeep, and he was explaining why there was a tiger coming. Right. And we, it was the barking deer, and it, it was the macaque monkeys that right. they smell it and see it long right. before we do. Right. And they're pointing at this thing. And my wife was saying, what are all these dogs doing around our Jeep? <laughs> and we were kind of ignoring her. It's like, shh, shh, don't scare the tiger. And so she waited a bit, and she said it again. And then finally our guide looks down, and he goes, oh, my goodness. He says, those are Indian wild dogs. He says, we never see those. They are, they are much more rare than the tiger. Really? And so we were very excited about this. Well, while we were taking our pictures of them below us, tiger goes past us and is now behind us. Oh my gosh. And we knew that because of the monkeys and the deer were right. now facing the other way. Wow. Flash forward to the end of the story, we see the tiger finally crossing the road and there's one of the rangers coming down towards us. Right. And our guide yells out, get back, you're going to scare our tiger away. Right. And I'm thinking, you're walking there without a weapon and we're worried about our viewing opportunities. It was kind of a funny end to, yeah. the, to the story. That, um, it's interesting. I mean, it was very, very sad that I did not get to see a tiger. But um, the fact that, that you did sort of sort of reinforces the fact that I now know that they do exist. They do. It wasn't just a myth. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, so your favorite country you had mentioned before we went on air was Borneo. I think and so, yeah. It's hard because, uh, as, as you've said before, it's, you haven't been to your favorite country right, yet. Right, right. But I, which I think is a great line. But if I had to choose one, I think I would choose Borneo because it's it's wild and right. you know some of the things that are so exotic, like like the orangutans, for right. example, right. and the Indian elephants that are hard to find, they're right. there. And if you go to the right place, you see them. And a lot of the birds are big and they're gaudy and they're funny looking and they're noisy and the people are wonderful. Right. And it's just a it's a great place to visit. So so tell me about orangutans because they are my favorite animal. Mm -hmm. um, so when 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 you take people with you when you guide people to places like Borneo, the first reaction of seeing uh, an orangutan must be just amazing for people. 
it's it's funny because your first reaction actually is not of wild animals, okay. wild orangutans. What we tend to do on these trips is we take you to a rehabilitation center okay. where there's been rescued animals. They're living in the wild, right? But they come in for feeding. So right. at ten o'clock, you're going to see an orangutan, right. right? And it's very different than being out in the bush, right? And seeing your first one out in the wild. It's like an elephant orphanage. Kind of, yeah. I've seen a few of those, yeah. yeah. And so the first one, it's more about learning a bit about them, about their biology, about the threats to them. Right. And then when we get into a place called Danum Valley in particular, which is in northeast Borneo, Right. Then you have a good chance of seeing a wild one. And then really, it truly is, oh my gosh, look at that incredible animal. Huge. I mean, they're big. And right. they're way up high in a fig tree eating figs. And it's kind of comical almost to yeah. watch them you know, daintily picking a fig off the tree yeah. and this huge hairy beast up there. And it's really exciting. Yeah, they're amazing animals. The, the babies are really cute too. They, yeah. really, they really are cute. So <clears throat> with your guiding, you must have had a few experiences that were quite comical with passengers, with, with your, your, your folks that you took with you. Is there anything that comes to mind that, uh, that you wanted to share with us? Is there any, have you lost any people en route? Uh, no, <laughs> okay. no. I did have one delightful woman. She was, oh goodness, I think she was 88 at the time. Oh my gosh. She weighed about 23 pounds, I think. <laughs> she was the tiniest little woman. And she mm. was still at her age running marathons, not fast. Really? So the problem for me as a guide was, she would rush to the edge of a cliff to get the best view. Oh. And of course, when you're that <laughs> Which tiny, makes your heart stop, well, right? It does, because then I had to explain to her, like, I need you just to stay back here with me. Right. I'll get you close at my speed. And so we never had a mishap with her, but it was terrifying because she was the first off the bus, right, right to the edge, the riskiest spots every single yeah. time. And oh, I can imagine. Uh, it's, I'm sure that, that when you're responsible for a number of people, it, it's the lowest common denominator is the issue, and you have to treat everybody at that level. Yeah. And uh, people do tend to do silly things, you know, especially when it comes to wild animals. I, mean, I was in Namibia, and we, there was a herd of elephants, and this jeep pulls up right in front of us, and then pulled right up into the path of the elephants. And this female elephant, we thought it was actually going to knock the, the jeep mm -hmm. over. And, you know, people just do silly things when they're, they're confronted by, by different. Um, so have you seen gorillas too? Have you? I did. I went to Uganda a couple of years ago specifically wow. to, to see the gorillas. And again, it's that magical moment where, mm -hmm. you know, I'm literally this close to a silverback right. and it looks at me and I look at it and you make this eye contact and it, it is the most incredible feeling you could ever imagine. You, you can't even, you know, yeah, yeah I know, words, words can't explain it. it. Uh, no, you yeah, can't. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Jeff, unfortunately, your time has come to an end. I'm very envious of what you've done other than the tiger sighting in India. I'm going to pass on that. But thank you so much for being here today. Very much enjoyed it. And we'd like to, um, I'd like to invite you all to join us next month when our guest is going to be Brent Harrington, who's going to come up with some ideas for the holidays. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. Thank you for watching and stay safe.